Um, so thank you. For the next 30 minutes, I'm going to take you through uh, a little bit of what we do in Canada and uh, some of our, our digital marketing best practices. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get into it right now. So who am I? So my name's John. I grew up in a small town uh, in the outskirts of Toronto. I attended Ryerson University, where I uh, majored in uh, business and I minored in e-commerce. I have over 10 years digital marketing experience uh, with some of North America's uh, biggest brands like Sears, Home Depot, Canadian Tire, and Office Max. Uh, I'm a lover of all sports. I play soccer, also known as football here, ice hockey, skiing, and golf. Uh, my teams I cheer for are the Canadian men's and, and women's national soccer teams and AC Milan because my dad's from Milan and I'm part Italian. And my favorite player is the best player in the world, right? Ooh. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's this guy, right? Look at that hair. Amazing. So what do I do? So I manage all traffic generations for Adidas.ca. So it includes everything from paid search, uh, product listing ads, display and social campaigns from Facebook and Instagram, uh, and affiliate marketing, which is a combination of discount websites and influencer marketing. And then I manage our whole CRM portfolio, which I'll discuss some of our campaigns that we do, reactivation, win back. Uh, and I'm also responsible for driving uh, some of the innovation that happens in Canada. And our mandate is through premium digital marketing, we will connect consumers to our websites, resulting in direct sales. So really, it's, it's not all about impressions. Well, it's important, but it's really about making connections with consumers. So where I'm from, how many people have been to Canada before? Scanning, okay, a couple people, nice. What did you think? It's cold? Is it really cold? Okay. It is cold in the winter. Don't come in the winter, come in the summer. So we're a population of 30, 36 million people. Uh, we're the second largest country uh, with land mass. Uh, just uh, Russia is bigger than us. And we have two official languages, English and French. So pretty much every kind of marketing we do is in either English or French. So what I'll be showing you today is, is just in English. Uh, we have more than 200 ethnic groups uh, in Canada's population. Uh, it's reported that in, by 2036, uh, about 30% of Canada's population will be immigrants. So we're a very diverse nation, and it's important that we need to, to connect with all these consumers uh, in these different ethnicities. The Asian community, community will represent almost 60% of this population of immigrants, which is huge, and we just did a case study that I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, and out of 82% 82, 82 of people living in Toronto will be either an immigrant or they'll be a child of an immigrant. So that's big too. Uh, and then the last, last piece is around 30% of Canada's uh, population. Their mother tongue, which means their first language, will not be English and French. So that's very important what languages we choose uh, to market in going forward. So a little bit more interesting facts because I want to set the tone for uh, the, sports, uh, the sports industry in Canada. Uh, our national sport was lacrosse, and now we have two, the winter sports ice hockey, uh, the summer sports lacrosse. Uh, basketball, invented by a Canadian. Interesting fact. Uh, and today, Canada has the largest population of uh, NBA players outside of the U.S. Uh, and then since 1998, soccer, or football, has been the most played sport from ages 5 to 14-year-olds. So we definitely love soccer. And, and interesting, in, all, in the 2014 World Cup, Canadians purchased almost 30,000 uh, World Cup tickets. So that's awesome to show we're, we're definitely a supporter of, of the beautiful game. So where does that fit us as, as the Canadian men's and national teams? Where our women's team is actually really good. So we're ranked fourth in the world, and actually we're beating Brazil by FIFA. So no booze. Okay, that one's good. And that's okay, because our men's national team is ranked 100th. And Brazil is second, so hopefully on the next World Cup, Gustavo, may, maybe some better luck next time? Come on, you're second, so. Too hard. So I'm going to give you an overview of our brand. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with uh, Adidas and the three stripes. Uh, so we have three brands under our umbrella, Adidas, Reebok, and Adidas Golf. We, we operate in 160 countries around the world, and we employ over 60,000 people. Our 2016 net sales were 19 billion euros, and that's 14% year-over-year growth. We had a very good year. We had a lot of good brand heat. We had a lot of great sell-through of our products, and we really need to keep up that momentum. 
We sold almost 1 billion units last year, which is amazing. We're focusing on sustainability. We're the fifth most sustainable company, uh, it, uh, company in the world, which I think is a, a very big testament and something we're, we're investing a lot more in. We had a first shoe, if you see right here, it's called the Ultra Boost Parlay, that was actually manufactured from plastics that were taken out of the ocean and developed into designing this shoe. So that shoe alone has 11 plastic water bottles that were taken out of the ocean and injected into the plastic made from that shoe. And that's a commitment that we've made moving forward is not to only just support this one time, but this is gonna go into our products moving forward. So not only shoes, but we have soccer jerseys that are also gonna be created in this. We have a ton of, we have a bunch of great collaborators. As you can see here, Pharrell, all about diversity and inclusiveness. Had a great project uh, with the Native American uh, people about including them and really getting back to the roots. Kanye West, one of our key influencers and hype man, he is really setting the trends in, in the streetwear game today and, and definitely a huge contribution to the success our brand's having right now. Stella McCartney, putting a, a, a sexiness back to athleisure in uh, the women's workout uh, industry. And then the last one, and definitely not uh, the least important is, is the farm company. So we have a great collaboration here with, with the Brazilian brand that we inject vibrant colors into the Women's Originals collaborations. So our belief, so we have a mandate, a belief that through sport, we have the power to change lives. Uh, and this is something that I truly, truly believe that, you know, starting kids in youth sports, uh, having, having that community feel really can write them on a, on a, on a right path to success. And it's something our brand uh, uh, definitely lives and breathes every day. One of our strategic thinking models is about creating the new. And creating new is really a strategy where we put ourselves in our marketplace. We have some of the toughest competitors in the industry. I'm not gonna say who they are, but one kind of looks like this, and the other is a letter followed by another letter. So just think about those two competitors when you're going up to it. Not to mention some of our wholesale partners like Amazon, and JD Sports in, the, in Europe. Definitely, definitely uh, a competition out there. So creating the new is a strategy that we've embedded that, that touches every point of, of how we deal, whether it's product development and merchandising, or it's, it's, it's in a driving innovation. It's all about kind of thinking about something different. And it's all about the athletes. So the athletes, we want them to be creators. We want them to come up with you know, cool, cool highlight video reels. And this goes down to the grass level too. We want them to have fun. We want them to always be creating. And I'm gonna show you right now our most recent brand spot. So if you could run the video, please. He's just hang, hang. It's terrible. Yo, enough already. We got this. We're making our own way. Many teams have started to change their names. So as you can see, all about having fun, right? We want to bring the fun and the creating the new back into sports. So three things I wanted to, you guys to take away from, from kind of the case studies and things we've done in the Canadian market uh, to help you guys better your business is I want you to be able to create a best-in-class digital marketing strategy that will connect your businesses to your consumers. I want you to focus on effective, not efficient. We hear the word efficient all the time, but if it's not effective, what's the point, right? So effective use of your digital marketing dollars. 
and I want you to know which marketing channels to leverage for each of your target consumer groups, because that's definitely something we're noticing, that our social audience is a lot different than our CRM audience. So it's very important to create these audience that are different and market specific messages to them. So how we structure our digital marketing practices is anything we do needs to touch, or touch one of these. And consider it a funnel. We like to call it the three stripes. So how you capture consumers. How do you get them to convert? And how do you, get them, or how do you retain them after that and build that, that lifetime value? So I'm going to go through all three with a couple of uh, different case studies. So the first one, capture. So the Euro, Con uh, Euro Cup was last year, and we decided to partner with Shazam, uh, more specifically, visual Shazam. So very, everyone knows how Shazam works. You open it up. When a song's playing, you hit it. It figures out what song it is. Visual Shazam is very similar. You open your phone, you hover over a picture, and it takes you to a landing page. So that's exactly how it works. So we had this activated in our stores uh, with hanging tags on retail displays. We put a sticker on a receipt that we saw really good engagement uh, from. And then we also had digital display banners. So this is really a snapshot of the one side where you see the round circle and then the hang tags of the performance. So we had about 4,000 visual Shazams from retail locations. Uh, I was really surprised that people were actually Shazamming in stores, which was quite interesting. Uh, and then visits to the landing page was about 16,000. So from there, not only did we get them to sign up, but we got them to our site and we were able to pixel them for remarketing afterwards. And then we, we got people to sign up for about 1,000 people signed up for e-newsletters. So right there, we get them into the funnel. Uh, we get them activated throughout a whole portfolio of CRM and digital marketing activities after that fact. So this is really, we also had advertising uh, in, in the in-app advertising as well, so you could win a shopping spree. And I think what's important here to notice is the demographic we hit. It, was, it ranged heavily more to males than females, but the age demographic of 18 to 35-year-old was that target market that we were hitting, was the demographic that we were focusing on with soccer, which is definitely something that's important and resonated with the consumer. So this is something cool that we partnered uh, with a small uh, tech company in Toronto, and we were using geofencing and beacon technology to essentially create audiences. So as you can see with the circle, that's BMO Field. So that's where our Toronto FC soccer team plays. And we also did this very similar approach with the Montreal Impacts Stadium, Saputo Stadium in Montreal. So what we did is we geotargeted this location when there were soccer games on it, and only for that day and only through that specific time period. So we know anyone in that specific location was a fan attending the game. So we created audience segments, and we injected them into Facebook, and we had a good match rate of about 50%. And even from then, it's not included here, but we added lookalike audiences to make this even bigger. So we saw some good engagement uh, from it. We didn't see a great return on sales. We kind of determined that a lot of these fans going to the games actually probably already had the jerseys. So what we can use this going on forward is how do we activate them when a new kit comes out or a new soccer boot. So this is some good learnings that we had uh, taken away from it. So our affiliates. So this is really playing on the new demographics and what the Canadian population is going to look like in the future years to come. We know it's going to be an Asian community is going to grow. Vancouver has a very big Asian popula population, uh, and we've, we've done some geotargeting with creative styles, but this is the first time we've actually really partnered with a full-on Chinese uh, language website. So Deal Moons is an affiliate. As you can see, it's predominantly in, in Chinese, and we saw an opportunity to connect with this consumer that loved our brand. So what we did is we essentially put marketing up there, we put promotions up there, and we saw a really good connection of this consumer with our brand. And we've been running our affiliates program for about four months. And in one week of having them live on this website, Deal Moon became 5% of our overall business. So now we're working with them to have more strategic priorities about early access to sale. How do we get them on exclusives? Because we're finding that's really a good match for this demo. And you get into some of our conversion tactics right now. So we look at a search engine results page, a SERP page, as the digital shelf. This is the, re this is the e com equivalent of what the retail shelf looks like. As you can see at the top, there's, a promo uh, there's the, the paid search ad. On the 
right-hand side, we have the product listing ads, and below is all your SEO value. So it's important that you capture as much of the shelf as you can with site link extensions, copy, and just making sure you have all the things in place that the Google guy talked about to win this digital shelf. So we have a couple different strategies we deal with or set up our campaigns. One's based around awareness. If we have a big campaign like the one you just saw, the video, that's all about back to, kind of back to school and back to sport, we'd focus on those categories for awareness. There's certain categories that we're going to compete in. Adidas running shoes or running shoes in general is one we definitely know our competitors are going to go after. It's going to be a high cost per click. It's going to be expensive. The return on ad spend, the ROAS is going to be lower. But we realize in order to be competitive in this landscape, we need to compete with them. And then there's certain groups that we just want to win and flat out win. And that's really any of our branded terms. So anytime someone's searching for Adidas, we want to control that experience. We want to win the consumer with the SERP, SERP result page. We want to get them onto our site so we can control that ex experience uh, start to finish. So my suggestion is own your branded search terms. Definitely think about you know, opening up the, the average or the max cost per click you have. Use personalization. So if you know someone has came to your website before for running, serve them a running ad. Doesn't make sense to serve them a soccer ad. And then leverage all possible site links like I referred to, to, to get up this maximum space. Google product listing ads. Uh, so this is something that we, we saw a shift that happened last year. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the mobile moment as quoted by Google, but this is when our branded search terms on mobile surpassed our desktop. So this was big for us and really shook up how we, uh, how we set up our paid search account. So we noticed at this point that we weren't doing enough. So what we had to do is essentially plan out how mobile especially with Google search results pages, is going to look and how we're going to win this customer. So PLA is after we kind of restructured our account. Now it represents almost 40% of our mobile spend. Uh, and our year-over-year -year growth, as you can see, is doing very well. Clicks are up 63%. Revenue's up 110 Our uh, return on ad spend is up 18%. And our average order value up 11 So this is showing me a couple of things. One, we did well and we hit where our customers are, are going. But when you look at the average order value, it's customers that are not only just coming for one product, they're actually shopping on their mobile device. And to us, that's important because we know a lot of education starts from a mobile, a mobile device. So even with low conversion on our product listing ads, it's important because we get them to our site, we can get them pixeled into the funnel, and we can retarget to them in different ways, whether it be on desktop uh, or through Facebook or social ads. Another really cool project we're working on right now uh, that I wish I could say was live, but it's taking a long time uh, to get up, is local, local inventory ads. I'm not sure if it's available in Brazil yet. Does anybody know? No one's nodding, so I'm going to say no. So local inventory ads are essentially an extension of product listing ads. So if you look at the first, uh, first image on the left side, so that's essentially a product listing ad. But if you look at the blue banner at the top, it shows you where that product can be found in one of our stores. So if it says 4.9 kilometers. So this is really connecting digital spend and, uh, and retail spend and creating an attribution model of, of essentially the whole consumer journey. So from that ad, not only can you be driven into a store, but you can be driven to the site where you can find that product and make a purchase. So a couple of things we, we questioned right off the bat. Is it going to cannibalize online purchases? No, it actually didn't. It actually increased. Will it drive people into store? Yes. And we were able to identify people coming into our stores with their Google Gmail addresses on their devices. We connected that with their geolocation and then made an assumption that based on the percentage of people uh, walking into the store that convert, we, we based it uh, uh, that way. So the pilot market, which we ran, I won't say which one, saw really great results. So the return on ad spend increased for local inventory ads, almost 500%. And then the return on ad spend for our, our normal ads was increased about 33%. So really big project. It incorporates three different feeds, your retail feeds, your e-com feeds, and then your store inventory feeds, uh, and, and, or your store location feeds. And Google has very strict policies about your inventory feed. It needs to be 97% accurate. So before you just think about going out and doing this, we're focusing on key categories like footwear, 
ensuring that our key product lines have the proper inventory in the stores and that it's accurate. Facebook carousel ads. So we use this, uh, this, this type of marketing for really, really campaigns that hit home. So ice hockey is huge in Canada. Uh, I just started playing. It's very difficult. Wear lots of equipment if you ever try it. Uh, so yeah, so this is World Cup of Hockey. So World Cup of Hockey is a group of nations that get together and play in a big tournament. So we created a Facebook campaign, Facebook and Instagram, uh, and we based our audiences on CRM data. So we got, we got CRM data from our database that said if anybody likes hockey, we pulled all those people out that like hockey, we injected it into Facebook, the email addresses, and then we did a match rate comparison and we created an audience. We also then layered on a lookalike audience to that group to expand our reach. I think one important thing we learned here was frequency capping. A lot of the times you run this campaign, these campaigns and you don't frequency cap. And I would highly recommend frequency capping because you don't want to show an ad to somebody 10 times if they haven't clicked on it. What's the point? I'm not going to say after two times, move on to somebody else, but clearly they're not interested in that specific time on that device. So definitely, we kept it at a frequency cap of two. We saw a return on ad spend go up. It was $4 and a quarter, which, is, which was really healthy for, uh, for social, uh, and something that uh, we took, took away as a, a success. Very similar, we used targeting re tar retargeting display for the NBA All-Star Game. So for the first time in the history of the NBA, uh, the All-Star Game was hosted outside of the US in Toronto. Uh, it was a great time. The city was, on, the city was just uh, alive with people uh, from all over the world, uh, just there for a good time. Uh, and so we decided to run a display campaign during this. So we used retargeting to help drive awareness and brand, brand presence during the event, uh, during, before the event and during the event. We drove people to our website where we could control the experience. We leveraged our database to, again, to identify those people that have an affinity with basketball, an interest in basketball over the past year. Uh, and we purchased space on only key websites. So if you are thinking about programmatic advertising, I highly suggest it, but in certain instances. For us, we wanted to spo specifically focus on mba.com and espn.ca because we know that's where a lot of people are going for their information. 75% of our Facebook ads were viewed on a mobile device. So it's, I think it's always important, had we known this in the beginning, we probably would have focused solely on mobile. So I would suggest if you run campaigns and they're longer than a week, let's say two weeks, ask your agency or ask your team to do a mid-campaign analysis to see where people are interacting with your, with your campaign. Because you might see something like this, 75% of ads were on mobile devices, and we could have shifted it to make all of our spend on a mobile and perhaps even seen a better return. So our return on ad spend was $8, which is super high and very, something that's very, uh, that we deem very successful. Uh, and then I think the last thing for, for conversion. So we use a vendor called Via Bandon, uh, uh, a bandit cart, and their pop-up uh, pop banners on our website. I believe V is a vendor here today. I'm not sure if anyone's in the room. But essentially what it is, it's to battle or improve your abandoned cart number, to de decrease your aban abandoned cart percentage. So here's a checkout page. So if somebody's scrolling to go off the website and click, click away, this banner automatically pops up. And there's a couple of different messages that we can say. You can tailor it to what type of product was actually in the cart. In this instance, it was an A16 pure control boot which is a soccer boot that has uh, no laces on the top and it's very limited, limited quantity. So we put up a banner that said, uh, leaving soon, this collection is limited, uh, continue shopping. So the hope is that they interact with this banner, click off of it, and then drive and complete the sale. Our year-to-date numbers here are, for all the times we've shown this, these different messages, we have a 10% engagement rate and a 3% overall conversion rate of somebody making the purchase. And I think what's really important is the engagement to conversion rate, which is somebody that has engaged with the banner and then made a purchase after that is 32%. So you can see if you make the message personalized and, to, and, and matches what the per person is actually purchasing, you can see a really good return. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, about how you retain your customers. 
I'm not a big fan of charts with lots of circles. Uh, this is one of them that just I thought would be the best way to explain. So in the center, we have our consumer database. We have all this knowledge about who likes basketball, who runs, who plays, looks like water polo. I'm not sure that's really big in Canada. Anyways, golf and weightlifting. So we segment them from men, women, and unknown. Unknown is just somebody that hasn't had a preference set or purchased the product of any of those, those gender specifics. On the top, we have people that have opted out. Canada has some of the strictest uh, compliancy laws in the world, and if somebody has opted out for an email and you send them an email, you can be heavily fined in the millions of dollars. So we have a separate category of opted out that we control that makes sure nobody sees those emails. After that, we have people that have opted in to receive them, and there's two segments of them. One, people have made purchases, and two, people that haven't, that are considered prospects. So of these consumers, our number one goal for prospects is to get them to convert. So we have welcome programs. We have a couple different version of, versions of them to help get them to the consumer uh, status of purchases. And then of the purchasers, consumers, we have two areas. One of inactive, and that's people that haven't clicked on an email within 180 days. And then we have the second one is active consumers. And active consumers and prospects essentially merge into our target database of who we send email deployments to. So e-newsletter enhancements and creatives. We're working with a vendor called Wiley to essentially make our creative more, more eye-stopping. How do we get them uh, mid-scroll? And this is a campaign we launched uh, for the Alpha Bounce footwear shoe. And what we decided to do was give little tiles that a consumer could go and click through to see what image really resonated with them. We gave them choice, give the consumer choice and, they will, and then you'll see a better, a better result. So our open rate was 14%, which is typically our average. Our click-to-open rate was two times higher than our average click-to-open rate. And 33% of all sales generated from this one email was of the Alpha Bounce shoe, which we deemed to be a huge success in actually selling that product line. The second e-newsletter enhancements we had is location-based. So this is an omni-channel sale we had, both in a retail and e-com store. Uh, it was a friends and family sale we launched a couple of, couple of months ago. So in this bottom section where you see the map and the store name, so that's actually a location extension that we use that, is ba that changes based on your geolocation. So this one here specifically is Vaughn Mills. So I opened it, it's near my office, it shows the closest store. If I was in Vancouver and opened this email, it would show me the Vancouver store, which is the closest. So the performance on the email itself wasn't great, but it definitely helped drive awareness and traffic to our stores, which is one of the key, key metrics that we were looking to do uh, within, within this uh, email deployment. Our shipping confirmation email. So our, our confirmation emails, all transactional from orders, from shipping and delivery, uh, were outdated. So we decided to look at them and think, think mobile first. Mobile is where the consumer is seeing your products. So we redesigned the template to be, again, 100% mobile focused. We introduced uh, self-serve customer service questions where they could go to our website and see different questions and answers to hopefully reduce calls. And we injected a technology that updates the delivery summary when it gets shipped out, when UPS truck has the product on the truck, and when it gets delivered. So if you notice right here, this is when UPS scans it. So it says, in progress, estimated delivery date, August 1st. And then once it gets on a truck, this updates in real time. So if a consumer opens the email again, this will show that it's out for delivery, and your new delivery date is July 20th. And then once it's delivered, you get, it updates again, and we'll show you that it's been delivered. So this really helps us mitigate any calls we can really get from customers about the delivery status. Triggered emails. So triggered emails, we have a couple of different programs. I'm going to touch on two of them. One is the reactivation. So when I talked about a consumer becoming inactive, it's when they haven't interacted with an email, so that's either opened or clicked within 180 days. So in order to keep them active, within the 90-day range, we send them an email saying, hey, here's a 40% off code. We value our relationship. Find something that will get you inspired on our site and make a purchase. So year-to-date results, we've sent about 100,000 emails. Our open rate is 21%, which is super high. 
and our click rate is about 10%. So we're able to reactivate 1,000 customers. And I know that number doesn't seem like a lot, but it's important to realize that we're continuing our average or, or continuing our customer lifecycle uh, journey with them. And, and, and the net result is it increases the average customer value spend. So this last cam campaign is uh, something that I think is super innovative. Uh, if you had a chance to read the interview I did with e-commerce Brazil, I touch on this a little bit. So what we're noticing is you know, a lot of products go out of stock. So we are a seasonal business that we arrange spring summer products and then we arrange fall winter. So what essentially we see happening is when products drop off the site or get sold, customers, we needed a way to, f to figure out how much demand is there for, a pr for this actual product. So what we, do, we did is when a customer looks and hovers on their side and it's not there, it's grayed out. And there's a button that says, click to be notified when your product comes back into site. So what we essentially, what they do is you click on it, you sign up for an email, and it triggers this one that says stay tuned. So it stays tuned, says that's the one, we'll inform you when our product is back to site. So there's two scenarios that can happen here. One, we find the product from either a retail category, maybe one of our wholesale partners has opened it up that we could pick that, that product and that, those units from the wholesale account and bring it to our site. And that would be the best case scenario because we're completing the customer journey there. And then the second uh, area is if we didn't, or separate, sorry, second option is if we didn't fulfill it and within 30 days, then we send you a sorry we did not find your size and we give them a 20% off code for our site. So our year to date is we fulfilled 16,000 orders uh, at a fulfillment rate of 15%, which is a huge amount of sales uh, that helped us for uh, fulfill these customers and, and ultimately give a premium experience. So not only is that data great and we can see by product, by category, where the misses are in our buys, but it also helps you forecast for the next season's product buys. So if you know a certain shoe ranges in a higher size and you're getting a lot of demand for, let's say basketball shoes that have size 14 to 18 that a lot of people are looking for, it's important then when you go to buy those products the next year, that you, you use all this information you have at your hands. So the last thing I want to touch upon is about leveraging your data. So we're in the process of implementing a data management platform, which I'm not sure how many people have out there. Uh, but this is something I'm, I'm very excited about. It's going to give us a holistic 360 view of all of our consumers' data in one spot. So we have app data, we have mobile data, we have desktop, CRM, email, and all of our media activity from our campaigns that are going on. And they all live in these separate areas. And we have to take the data in these separate areas like Facebook and Google and kind of derive our own learnings. Whereas the DMP, essentially, we're gonna plug all this information in and not only will we will be able to easily access this information, but you can enable machine learning to help derive outcomes, help build attribution models for online and offline uh, uh, marketing, which I think is, uh, is definitely, definitely the future, so definitely consider a DMP. So just to recap the three things, I want to take you away. I hope you got some good examples that I said. Create a uh, best-in-class digital marketing strategy that will be able to connect your businesses to consumers. Create effective, not efficient use of your, your marketing spend and know which markets to, uh, marketing channels to leverage for each target customer group. Oh, sorry, I want to go back one. So the last video I want to show you uh, is from our originals brand and it's called My Way. And I think the important thing to take away here is every company is different. So one thing that works for your company might not work for another. So it's important to be diverse in what you do. It's important to be agile. It's important to test, see what's working. Uh, so yeah, so your way might not be the same for another person. So if we can roll the video for my way, please. I did what I had to do And saw it through Without exemption I planned Each chartered course Each careful step Belong 
the byway. More? Much more than this? I did it my I did it my way. Yes, there were times. I'm sure you knew. When I bit off more than I could chew. So as you can see, two, two very different videos, right? One very spoke, uh, focused on sport, which is one of our markets, and then one very focused on uh, streetwear and lifestyle. And I think the, the really perfect connection there was it never finished. So originals is never finished. And you know, e-commerce is never finished. Digital marketing is never finished. So again, test and try different tactics. Don't be afraid to fail. If you do, fail fast and fail forward. Uh, and I think that's where I'll leave you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, John. Thank you.